Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Praise Allah. Let's get ready to start our Sabbath afternoon service. If I could get you to find yourselves a seat and let's get ready to open up the service. How many of you are excited to have the, the opportunity to be here? Hallelujah. Sometimes you get so accustomed to doing things that it becomes a ritual or it just it can get to where it's just normal or ordinary, mundane. You just do it going through the motions. And you have to remember that in every person's life there are seasons that, that things are happening where if you're not careful you can let the mundane kind of settle in and it becomes an opportunity for you to miss the appointment that Father has with you. And I believe with all my heart that the Shabbat is a divine appointment. We, we've said it so many times over the years that I know you can probably get tired of hearing it, but it's a divine appointment. And if we are expecting that, if we are expecting to come to a place to where we can know that there is going to be an encounter with the Most High, and if you study the Torah, anytime there was ever an encounter with His presence, people's lives were changed. I want that. And I believe, consistent with that, as my life being changed and I'm being conformed into His image, do you think maybe that I would become an instrument of change in somebody else's life? So let's anticipate that this afternoon. As we're being conformed into His image, as we're being allowed the honor, the privilege of praise and worship and lavishing our affections on Him, it's not too much of a stretch of your imagination to consider the people around you that are also part of His body. They're being changed as you are. And so instead of looking for the, fr the flaws, the frailties, the the peculiarities that make us different, why not look for what we have in common and that's that anticipation of His presence in the house. Can we do that? Help me then. Those of you that are listening live, help me as you're sitting wherever you are in your house or whatever. Let's make Him welcome during this particular time. Father, we bless you. Father, we thank you from the depths of our spirit man that you have privileged us Father, and I ask you to help us to never take that lightly, that we would trifle with you and your presence and your affections. Father, help us to remember that where the, your spirit is, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's the ability to be healed, delivered, set free. Father, to become an intimate part of your life and rather than something that's an afterthought because we fail to take advantage of this opportunity. We ask you, Most High, that you would begin to speak into our lives this afternoon as we're looking for answers to the challenges, the things, the circumstances around us, that you would help us to remember that if we would seek you first, set our affection on you, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. You are the object of our affection this afternoon we ask you holy one to allow us to be able to worship you and to praise you and to receive that in the spirit that it's offered this evening that it would not be something done just out of having to or simply because it's an exercise in fruition father let it be this afternoon an opportunity for us to see that the hosts of heaven are looking over the portals and looking into the lives of these people that are willing to praise you in spite of what may be happening. And Father, we're determined. We're not going to let anything hinder in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Now I want to ask you, if you have a shofar, if we're expecting him to come into this house, let's blast these shofars and raise a cry to him to let him know, to let this community know that he is welcome in this house. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen and amen. Let's get ready to do some praise and worship. Help me. Hallelujah.
Turn to your neighbor and tell them there's something going to happen in your life this afternoon. Amen. You believe that? I believe that Abba has plans for us. And I'm convinced that it's not an accident that you're here this afternoon. And so if you can believe that, then you should be in what I would call a mode of expectancy. Some of us probably never get there very often when it comes to relationship with Him, right? That's why you're always in a roller coaster relationship. But if you're expecting Him to move, then my goodness, as we were sharing earlier, the most opportune times for Him to demonstrate Himself is when it looks as if the Calvary is not going to make it in time. Say amen. Hallelujah. You know what I found? If there's no Calvary there, I'll, I'll sound charged myself. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, charge! You see that lack of response? Turn to your neighbor and ask him, what's wrong with you today? Hallelujah. Are you excited? Yes, you are. I'm excited. Today is a day of the miraculous. Today's a day that lives are going to be changed. And I believe with all my heart that there has been a word that's been sent specifically for us. And if we can believe that, then we have to have an air of expectancy because when His word comes, it's like a surgeon's scalpel. It goes in and it cuts out what doesn't need to be there and it causes healing and restoration. And I believe with all my heart that as we begin to prepare ourselves this afternoon, we've got to do everything we can to get our flesh under control. Amen? How many of you believe you got your flesh under control? All right. I want you to do me a favor. Look up here at me. Do your hand just like this. Put it right under your neck. And I want you to say, flesh, Flesh. you're going to pay attention this afternoon. (laughs) Hallelujah. Give Abba a praise offering as we welcome Shepherd John, Pastor John. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Can we all stand up together? Shabbat shalom, everybody. That should be a familiar greeting, right? We're going to open up with a word of prayer. Abba, we thank you for your... Can we turn this mic down just a little bit? I don't want to scare myself. (laughs) Abba, we thank you for your, your mercy that endures forever. Thank you for your love for your people. Abba, we thank you for your plan and your purpose that even when all things seem like they're going to hell, you are still seated upon the throne in complete control. Abba, we know and we thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Abba, we thank you that even now we're all protected physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. There's nothing that can harm your people, Israel. There is nothing that grabs you by surprise. Abba, we praise you and thank you that you have caused breath to return back into us when we woke up today. We weren't promised today, but by your grace, your chen, your rachamim, your loving kindness, you have extended another day for us. And may, may we have many more, many, many more. Abba, we thank you that walls are being broken down that your word is truth and we stand upon your very word that is written and your very word that is spoken. Abba, we pray that your word will minister to each and every one of us today that are in here and those that will be watching and those that are watching. May your bracha, your blessing, your favor rain down upon all, whether they are elderly or whether they are newborns. May your rachamim, your favor, your anointing rain down upon each and every one of us. And we thank you and we seal this prayer as your word gets ready to go forth in the name of Yahushua, Mashiach, amen and amen. Give your neighbor a big high five or a hug and let them know how grateful you are that they are here and you are here together. Hallelujah. I'm amongst beautiful people. Oh, look at this. See? He's going to make sure I'm encouraged today. Thank you, Levi. We're going to go for another walk. Hallelujah. How many people have had a great, exciting, and challenging week? Raise your hand. All right. You're, you must be in a good place. 
because if it's not challenging, it's always going well, or it seems like it is, something might be wrong. The enemy is not intimidated by those who are not pursuing the crown of glory. The enemy is not intimidated. He is not impressed by those who do not pursue to sit at the feet of Mashiach. I know sometimes that's challenging. But today we're going to finish this short, small series. And I'm really blown away because I did not know it was going to go down on such a broad, such a narrow, all at the same time, and challenging avenue. I had to remove, I told Dave, six pages of notes that I'll insert in here some other time, somehow, I don't know. But I'm really blown away at the times that we're living in. And the times that we're living in, Abba is trying to get our attention. He is really trying to get our attention. He's trying to get the people of Yah to listen, to have ears to hear what the Ruach is saying to his assembly. And when we read in the book of Revelation, there's seven assemblies, seven congregations that are there. It's really one body, but there's seven faces of the body that are being dealt with in the book of Revelation. Seven faces. It just seems like Abba loves to deal with faces. And you can tell, even in this time we're living in, you can tell when someone just doesn't even like your presence. It's in their face. Your face will tell on you. It will tell on you. I remember Ashley was sharing with us. She told me a long time ago, Dad, try not to frown so much. I was like, okay, I'm smiling. I guess I was frowning. It was like a frowning smile. I don't know. She says it takes 42 muscles right around that area in the face to frown. Well, 42 is a number that deals with tribulation time and time of major testing that you'd never ask for. So why put our face through a tribulation time before it's time, right? It takes less muscles to smile and more muscles to frown. So let's start smiling a little more. And I'm not talking to anybody in here, but you guys know who we're talking about. They're not here today. When you see them, smile, even though they might not be. Hallelujah. So this is going to be part three. Anybody remember the name of the Hebrew rendering? I probably should have made that a little lighter. So that's my fault. But it's part three. It's kerav. Say kerav. ha Hoshniot. The battle of the breastplates. And we kind of touched on some things already in regards to this. This is, not a, this is not exhaustive whatsoever. If you came today expecting to hear all and the totality of the revelations of what this title is, well, I hate to disappoint you, you're not going to get it today. There's just no way. It, this thing is unraveling and I'm blown away at all the insights that are here. I did not know that I was going to open up a Pandora box of its own dealing with this. So let's just get right into this. <clears throat> you guys know that we've been called to be the image bearers of the Most High. Did you know that? Did you guys know that? Hopefully I'm talking to people that are alive and well today. We were just praising him for giving us breath, opening up our eyes for another day. I know you guys are listening. But we are instructed to be called the image bearers of Elohim. That is exactly what the first Adam was given. He was given the image of the creator here on earth. There are some sages that believe that when Adam was created, he was so tall, we don't know how true this is, but it's just fascinating, that his head was higher than the clouds. Whatever that means, I don't know. Physically, the way that would look would be frightening as hell. And I say that would frighten hell right out of everything and everyone, right? Would you guys agree with that? That would be freaky looking to see someone in a body of light walking whose head is just bouncing through the clouds. That is fascinating. No wonder the enemy tried to mimic through the Nephilim and giants something that was supposed to be the first Adam's uh, authority and, and, and composition. They were trying to mimic. The enemy always tries to mimic the plans of the enemy. All the time we see it left and right. And I'm going to tell you guys something. If you were to watch certain movies, there are certain laws within the federal government that 
the people have to be notified of certain things, so they have to put it through the entertainment world first. A lot of people don't even know that. It's not a game. They're putting things in plain sight to get our attention, and all you got to do is turn the television on, not encouraging guys to spend your whole day watching movies and using the excuse like, no, 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 telling your wife or your mom, no, 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 I'm taking notes down because they're hiding things in plain sight, so we got to get this movie down here. And I'm not talking about that. The fact of the matter is that's what they're doing, though. And when I say they, I'm going to leave the they to the they. The they, the ones that are doing these types of things. We're seeing supernatural things transpire over and over and over again. We are being challenged. Religious minds are going to be challenged. Hearts are going to be challenged because the powers that be are conjuring up portals, doorways, access points from multi-dimensional things. And this is not a joke. You have scientists, military people, uh, certain officials that had high-level security accesses coming from all over the planet admitting to these things. There's something happening. And yes, there's some flaws and lies that are coupled with that to sidetrack people not to pay attention to what's going on. But the system is desensitizing mankind to fall for a great great delusion. And the Bible, the scripture says that if it be possible, if it be possible, even the very elect will be deceived. If it be possible, only you and I can define the possibility of that happening in our lives as individuals. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. We are called to be sons. And when I use the word sons, I'm not just, just distinguishing the men. I'm using it for both man and woman. We are to be builders of the kingdom, sons of light. And for those that, that might have a problem with me just saying that, and daughters of light, children of the most high, children of light, children of the day, children of righteousness, children of purity, children of modesty, children of holiness, kadusha, children that are set apart unto the most high to live a set apart life unto him without wavering to the left or to the right or whatever's coming our way through the lies of television also of certain facades that you have to keep up with, false images that appear real. They're not real. The image that we are to reflect is the image of our creator. <laughs> Period. Period. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 4 going all the way to verse 8. I want to read and I'm going to, hi- I'm going to try to highlight with my voice. I try to be as detailed as I can and just a word of encouragement this is not an exhaustive study not even on the stones. You guys want to know some revelations on stones, go talk to Nitsa Moshe. She deals with these types of things all the time and their frequencies, their colors, their names and so on and so forth. We got some insights in here but there's a bigger picture than just a mere stone or 12 mere stones or what would appear of nine mere stones that were were flames of fire that Lucifer walked in. There's, like I said last week, there are so many things in the Bible and scripture that you can read up on without filling your mind with what the movies has to present to you, which is mixed with truth and lies. It's part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is. So we've got to use wisdom. So I'm going to try to do this justice. This has been a challenging thing. Like I said, the Pandora's box had been opened up and I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I've had my life threatened over some of the information in here years ago. Believe it or not, you can ask my family, ask the ministry. We had our, our uh, death threat because of some things. So I said, oh, we must be doing something right. But to use wisdom, not excitement and emotion and flesh, I've just removed it for the sake of Abba directing me. It's not about me. As exciting as the stuff is, there's some things I did remove to be obedient. Because it's better to be obedient than to offer up some type of a sacrifice because the sacrifice you offer is not always what Abba wants. He wants your heart and that's the first thing we have to give him. So let's get right into this. I have until what time, Pastor Dave? Nine o'clock tonight. Lock the doors. Nobody's leaving. And the children that are in here are like, Mom, that's not what you said. Dad? I'm just kidding. We're kidding. 1 Thessalonians 5.4, if you have your scriptures, turn there. It's always good. One day there's not going to be any phones, computers, none of this stuff. We better have some hard copies of some stuff. You guys agree? I love that. Just the sound of the pages is just amazing to me. I don't know. 1 Thessalonians 5.4, but you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. 
For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. So then we should not sleep as others do, meaning you should not become sluggish. Remember when the quail, the children of Israel, they say, we want meat, 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 meat. We want food. Give us the, give us something that will satisfy our fleshly appetite. So the creator says, okay, you guys want some meat? I'm going to give you so much meat. It's going to come flying out your noses. It's going to come out of everywhere in your body and you're going to wish you never even had it. And the words that they use there for quail is actually the word for sluggishness. So Abba says, the, the more your fleshly appetites are fed with these spiritual carbohydrates, the more it's going to slow you down. You've got to have a spiritual keto diet. <laughs> I knew I'd make one of you smile and laugh. Now that we shook off the heebie-jeebies, but let's keep going here. Verse, uh, verse 6. So then we should not sleep as others do, but we should watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. There's so much embedded in this. But we who are of the day, say the day. Day. Say sons of light. light. Sons of the day. day. Say day. day. Should be sober, putting on the breastplate of belief, of faith, of emunah. Putting on the breastplate of the amen. Meaning, let it be so, let it be fulfilled, let it be complete, let it be stationary, let it be immovable. Amen. Isaiah says this, the, the creator speaking through the prophet Isaiah saying, who has believed our report? That's, that's not what it says. It says, who has amened our report? Who has amened what we're saying here? Who has made it f- complete on the earth as it is in heaven? Who's willing to have that kind of belief to make things established on the earth as they're already finished in the heavens? So put on the breastplate of belief and ahava, love, as, and as a helmet, the expectation. You have got to come expecting Abba to save you every Sabbath. You have got to expect salvation every Shabbat. Meaning this, there is something you struggle with during the week that Abba says, come and enjoy my rest and receive your deliverance from that struggle that happened during the week. You have to come expecting your salvation and your deliverance. And salvation is not always referring to going to heaven because guess what? You remember the good news? Nobody's going to heaven. There might be some dogs that go to heaven, I don't know, but I know that we're not going to be in heaven. We're not designed to live there. We have never been given the type of uh, vessels and and, 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 uh, bodies to live there. We have been designed to live on the earth forever. So no matter who you are as a believer, as a follower, as Abba has directed you and guided you through your life, if you have gone on from this world, we're going to see you again here on the earth. That's exciting, especially with with those that we love. Ezekiel, let's look at the foundational verses of what we're looking at. Like I said, it's not extensive. There's some things we're going to look at. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of, of your timbrets or your drums and of your pipes, your, wing, your wind instruments was prepared inside of you in the day that you were created. This is speaking about Lucifer. It's not speaking about the, the king of Tyre and so on and so forth because he wasn't in Eden. So it's, it's a prophetic insight of, of what was in the eternal past. And like I said before, we have got to, no matter how smart we are, we have got to admit that none of us have spent quality time in the eternal past to have a dogmatic answer to anything referring to it. Would you guys agree with that? I don't know of anyone that has. We haven't seen Enoch for quite some time. Elijah, he's up in the clouds, whatever that means. He's not in the heavens, the chariots, because he was here still after he ascended up and passed his, his mantle onto Elisha. He was still here writing a letter to a king some eight years after he was ascended up. So go figure that one out. Let's move on. If you, it's real simple to look at some comparisons. All you got to do is go to Ezekiel 28 and Exodus 28. And you'll see the comparison of the, of the breastplate. So I like when that happens. That makes studying the scriptures a little easier. When whoever put the chapter breaks in there, they lined it up so that we can find things a little easier. 
And I won't read it for, verbatim, but I just want to look at the, uh, the uh, stones here. We have in the first row of stones, it's the sardis, the topaz, and the carbuncle. And the Hebrew names of these are, are different than what you see in English. Some of them are uncertain what the heck they are. They're uncertain of what the actual stones are. And there's a lot of deep debate on what these are. And notice how the New Agers are into the stones. You see, man has always desired to be a part of the supernatural. Man, whether a believer or not, man has always been curious about the unknown, the spirit realm, the supernatural trying to knock on the doors of spiritual entities which are forbidden. And one of the biggest ones is looking at the zodiac and desiring the answers from the zodiac for your fortune in life. That's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. It's the enemy dangling those things over the heads of the curious. Sardis, topaz, carbuncle, emerald, sapphire, diamond... We have the agate, the, 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 the liger, I think it is, the amethyst, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper. These are the stones that were inside the breastplate of Aaron, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel in their individuality, in their individual standing, in their individual placement, in their individual doorway. Each one of the stones, I'll prove it to you in a simple fashion. Each one of the stones is an access point. Each one of the stones is a porthole. I'm just going to say the word. I said I wasn't going to say it, but don't think I'm going one direction. Each stone was a stargate. How do we know that? Because we see the new Jerusalem that descends in the book of Revelation, and there's 12 stargates to get into that super spiritual, supernal Jerusalem that descends from the highest heavens above. You need a stargate of entrance, and you need the right body to go through it. I know, it's going to get weird. It really is. <laughs> but we can clearly see that there is a major difference between the two types of breastplates. One of them has 12 stones. One of them has nine. We now come to the pinnacle of this week's study. This is part three. The still ongoing, it's an ongoing battle between breastplates. And like I said, I'm just going to deliver this and it's up to you guys to search it out and test the scriptures and test the scrolls. The first week we went over all these different types of scrolls that were found. Some of them were part of the canon of scripture and then they were removed because of the biases of those that were experts that said that won't fit the canon. We, got, we can't put that one in there. But we must not alter the finger of Abba here on the earth as if we can really do that. Is he allowed things to be written and penned and scribed for our learning? As Timothy says, all scripture is Elohim breathed. All scripture. All scripture. All of it. Who told us to constrict the breath of the Most High? But we come to this pinnacle here. This battle that goes on, even today, on multi-level subjects, you guys, this is one that is forged in eternity past. There was an earth or a heaven as we know it, and this was forged before those were even created. The other breastplate is one of an eternal standing of a super spiritual, and after you, I try to find the biggest words because we can't comprehend this. It's bigger than us. A super conscious and supernal place. You tell me heaven is not something like that. This misses the mark to try to describe that. We can't get it down pat. We don't have enough English, English words to describe the heavenlies. The book of Enoch didn't even do it justice. They did the best they can. There were things shown that were forbidden to be spoken of. The breastplate that is seen in our celestial bodies, all 12 of them, also known as the luminaries of distinction. They're called the celestial bodies of fire and breath. The 12 luminaries. I'm not here to talk in detail about those things. Yes, the heavens above, as re they reflect the very breastplate that we see that would match our Savior and King. And even Aaron's breastplate reflected those things. Pastor Dave and I were talking about something very interesting. Some insights to the calendar, repair and return. And very intriguing insights to the upper room of Acts chapter 2 where there was only 120. There, but there was 500. 
But then it went down to 120, not 119, not 121, but 120. Why 120? You see, the redemptive plan of the creator is bigger than what we feel. It is dealing with the entire cosm the, the cosmos, every planetary system, every galaxy and the multi-universes, whatever is out there. I don't know. I haven't gone that far. We haven't been to the moon. How many people have been to the moon? Only one. I've been there too. It's just there's a little section out of Arizona that's not too far, and it's, it's called the moon landing, but you won't see it on the maps, right? So that's a whole other discussion. But to, back to this 120. We see there was 120 believers. They were believers in the high priest king, and we saw yesterday, last week, excuse me, with the marker codes that refer to the Mashiach as yod Hey vav He Yahushua HaMashiach. They kept him covered, protected in the skins of the Greek language. But we're going to look at some things in regards to repair. 120. Why or why not? Why not more? Why not less? Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Is this okay so far, you guys? I'm trying to at least have three, four scriptures so we were Bible-based. At least three or four. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. What, 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 a, what a description here. And the moon was under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. That's why in the new Jerusalem, in the in eternal state, way in the future, the women will not be giving birth to children like now, because then it's a painful thing. I believe we're going back to Eden and everything pertaining to Eden. We're going to receive our new bodies of light, embers of burning flame, the color of a blue sapphire type look to where we match the throne of Abba down here as the nation of Israel, as the people of Yah, reflecting the throne room above down here. No wonder the earth is his footstool. Why? He rests his full support within the people of Yah that are here on earth. <clears throat> And there appeared a wonder, another wonder in the heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew, say the tail, the tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So I want you to take note. There's 12 stars here in the book of Revelation, 12 stars of heaven, one third of the stars were drawn away by his whipping tail, one third was drawn away. How could this be? Could it be that Revelation is hinting to a multiple prophetic fulfillment? I would say yes it is. Prophecy has multiple layers. We have seen CERN, how many people have seen that mass hadron collider? That's some freaky stuff now. They're doing, they're, they're, there's some stuff happening that's very, very interesting. I have a buddy of mine, he was part of SEAL Team 4, and he's seen some things. He shared some stuff with us when I worked on the railroad yard. I won't throw his name out there. I don't want to throw him out there like that. He does it on his own very well, and he doesn't care. <laughs> Former SEAL Team 4, uh, also he was special forces on another country before he came here, and he shared some things and showed us some very interesting pictures, Polaroids of some stuff you can't alter and, pr and pretend. There is something happening that is huge. There is something happening that is massive right before our eyes and right under our nose. We have got to be rooted and grounded in the truth. I hope you guys are listening. You must, I must be rooted and grounded in the voice that gave us this word. Because there are voices that are talking already. There are distractions and deceptions that are taking place. We must not fall prey to those things. It is going to get very strange, wild, and crazy. Strange, wild, and crazy it's going to get. So we've seen CERN, the massive Hadron Collider, the Lucifer Telescope. The, that goddess statue of Shiva. This is old news. It's not even something, this is actually thousands of years old. 
They've had computers and, and, and colliders and, and all this supernatural stuff for thousands of years. I remember I heard Brad Scott and, and then I checked out what he said. They had computers, cell phones. They had stuff through San hydraulic powering systems to function with like what we have today. They had some kind of help from somewhere. And I'm not here to talk about aliens and UFOs. The life that Abba focuses on is the life right here on planet Earth. And I'm going to prove it to you. It's the only place on record that he says he loves. I'm going to show you in a, in a minute. So we have all this stuff. Man is trying to open the stargates and let demons in and get it all done with the planned nine hadron colliders that are on planet Earth today. Nine stone, nine colliders, nine, the, the nine stones that reflect, the ten stones in the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, it just popped in my mind, the uh, Georgia Guide Stones, ten stones, and you see nine faces there though. Very fascinating and very interesting to look at. So let's look at the phrase from the book of Revelation, tail that drew, and you can go look at the Greek, which is fine, but I wanted to take it back to the Hebrew, and one of the best tools we have, if you don't have the tool, get you a polyglot. Polyglot is the Greek Strong's numbering system based off of the Septuagint, so when you see a Greek word in the New Testament, you can go and look at that Greek word in the New Testament, you can see where it's at in the Septuagint, and kind of get an idea, connection, can't be 100% uh, positive, but you can get a strong idea of the Hebrew equivalent that would have been used in the time of the writing of that. Just a little side note for you guys. But let's look at this tale that drew in Hebrew. It's the Hebrew phrase, lezanav shlach. Say that. Lezanav shlach. It wasn't something frightening, I guarantee you. Don't be afraid of the tail, because we're not the tail. We are the head. We're above and not beneath. Don't be afraid of the tail. Le zanav shlach. And zanav means to attack the weakest point of the rear or the beginning of a people. Shalach means to send out. It's a word where we get apostle from. It's, it means the shoots of a plant. It's what Amalek did to Israel in Deuteronomy 25 verse 18. They came at Israel's most weakest spot to bring the attack. It's the lowest place of influence. And it's also shalach. Look at this one. It means one who works with the flesh of animals. Interesting, interesting. Shalak also means one who deals with skin. Also, Adam was, remember, he was sent out in his weakness, which was the fall, le zanav. So looking back at Revelation, we have the dragon that Revelation speaks about does something on multiple levels. He does what Genesis 1 verse 1 through 2 conceals, also known as that gap theory. I'm not here to go into the details of that. I got, I got my views on that. Some, something did happen though. You've got to admit when you look at the words, and we're going we're gonna to try to connect a few verses to prove how many people believe that when the creator creates, he does not create any Anything empty, void, and without a purpose. How many people believe that? I do. When he creates, he has an intent. His intention is purposed. And he is filling his creation. We see that it's very clear. He didn't just create plants. He says, no, we got to do things in order. I'm going to create the laws of nature first. And all things in the natural realm are going to have to abide by this no matter what they say. Because the law of nature is connected to the ground. It's connected to the wind. It's connected to the fire. And it's connected to, to water. These are the laws of nature. The way they function, the laws of nature. The creator put them in there for a specific reason. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. Are you guys okay? Everyone good? Jeremiah 4, 23. I looked at the earth and saw it was formless and empty. And the heavens, they had no light. Think really hard about creation, the beginning. When he created everything, he created things that had form. He created things, fill, he filled his creation. When he created Adam, it says that he, vaipach, he blew into him. That's where bara, bara means to inflate something. Bara means to fatten up something, to expand something, to make it more three-dimensional. Bara, to expand 
So Jeremiah, I looked at the earth and saw it was formless and empty in heavens. There was no light. I looked at the mountains and saw they shook and all the hills were swaying. When did that happen? No, it was not the flood of Noah. That did not happen like this. Keep, let's keep reading. So this is something that happened before the flood of Noah that the prophet is looking at. I looked and saw the, gar excuse me, I looked, verse 25, I looked and saw there was no Adam. That's what it says. Read the Hebrew. There was no Adam yet. So something happened on the earth before Adam came that caused a void and a chaos on the planet. I looked and saw, excuse me, there was no man, no Adam, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I looked and saw the garden land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of yod heh vav -Heh by his burning displeasure. For thus said yod heh vav -Heh, all the earth shall be a ruin, but I shall not make a complete end of it. When did this happen? We're going somewhere. When did this happen? It happened between verse 1 and verse 2. It had to have, because there's no record of anything else happening at this level, this demonstrative judgment of some sort that hit the planet. There's no way. Some say the flood of Noah. No, the mountains were not shaken to, to rubble. There were men on the earth. Who were they called? Noah and his family. So it could not have been that time. Could not have been. Let's look at the phrase, it was formless and empty. The Hebrew rendering of this is vehine tohu vabohu. And it means and became formless and empty. So the earth became formless and empty according to the scriptures. This is a game changer on history. The earth became tohu vabohu, but we're going to take this even further. Where can we match this historical account up to seeing that the scripture never shows a time when there, when the, an event like this had taken place and where there was no Adam on the earth, no, not even the flood of Noah hints to this level of devastation. So where do we see the phrase tohu vabohu? Where do we see it? We see it in Genesis chapter 1. Let's go there, verse 1 and 2. It says this, Breshit bra Elohim et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz ve-ha-aretz hayata tohu vabohu. Verse 2, and the earth became hayata tohu vabohu. It doesn't even mention the heavens. The earth became void and empty. This is the realm where you can connect probably dinosaurs and the giants. There was a time where Adam wasn't here yet, where something roamed and was unleashed upon the earth, or could we say, fell from a higher order and became sort of like a god of this world and began to distort with the creator allowing this thing to take place for a bigger purpose that we cannot fully comprehend in its totality. But scripture proves our creator does not create anything imperfect, void of purpose or formless or chaotic. He never does. He will use these elements to bring about a greater plane because he is always many, many steps ahead of the enemy. Formless means the lack of a kingdom image. There was no kingdom image on the earth anymore, so he had, he had a plan already. He was going to create the first king high priest of the earth straight out of the Garden of Eden and ordain him. And or, Adam was anointed with more authority than any created being or animal ever on the earth, ever. He had the ultimate authority under the creator himself. He was anointed for that. He was anointed to bring forth the kingdom. That's why the scripture says the creator is instructing and commanding him to have dominion on the earth to bring the king's presence in the earth as the dominion ruling authority rod of the scepter of righteousness he was supposed to bring here. The earth became formless and empty of kingdom dominion. Man is to be the express image of the king here on earth. 
A royal priesthood of people who know how to unlock the stargate of Eden, if that's okay. If I'm rubbing you wrong, just allow Abba to minister to you. So we're going to see if scripture proves that our creator does not create anything without a purpose, formless and empty, okay? We're going to go there. Isaiah 45, 18. Hopefully I'm not going too fast because I get excited. I got to slow down a little bit because there's so much I want to share with you guys here and that's not on here and uh, my spirit is... Lit up to the maximum. For thus says Yohei Vavhe, creator of the heavens. He is Elohim. This is the prophet Isaiah, one of the dominant and, and highly respected prophets of the time in whom, remember, many, many scrolls of Isaiah were found. Some of the wording was changed a little different in some areas according to those who had the experience of that time. He established the earth. Excuse me, the, the, for thus says yod heh vav creator of the heavens and earth, he is Elohim, former of the earth and its maker. He established it. He did not create it empty. He did not create it empty. And he did not create the earth empty. This is an easy comprehension. We just see it. That's what the word says. We move on and we can start connecting the dots of some things. He did not create the earth empty whatsoever. So let's look at this. Empty, tohu. Empty, lack of substance, void of dominion, confusion. It's also a word that means time travel, like a wormhole effect, creating a tohu by eliminating the bridge. Some might say, how come you're not teaching a message, John? I, I, this was recently too. John, how come you're not teaching this week or, the, or recently a message on salvation? Well, you need to be saved? Well, we'll give you what you need then. This message right here is, is here to open up those who have been saved, if I can use the term. Wake up, saved people of Yah. Some hell's about to happen across this planet. You want to be in the right place at the right time with the right people, with the right mindset, right heart, right spirit, so that you don't fall prey to what the enemy is doing. The enemy is going to look for those who seclude themselves away from community. You just watch this. It's going to happen again. Those who seclude themselves away from the community and want to stay home because it's convenient. The enemy is going to come at you first because you are a threat to his plan. He's going to come at you first because where there's a corporate collective unity that grows strong and is fortified and is fused together, the enemy does not want to come at that first. He wants to use a strategic way and try to get in from the inside first and destroy it from the inside out. This is why when we are in a community of believers, we should submit to the authority of those who you trust to come up and share the word of Yah. If we have ears to hear the men and women that come up to share the word of Yah, they should be trusted enough to be submitted to not as a weak thing. It is a strong thing to keep you accountable and you keeping them accountable. Creating a tohu by eliminating the bridge between the two, heaven and earth. The Toph priest prefix speaks of a future and past hyperdimensional access point. The creator did not allow this in the beginning. But something happened that caused the earth to become tohu vabohu, void of movement. Tohu deals with a stargate control and Bohu deals with the lack of vibrational energy. And it's a very powerful type of kinetic energy that's, that's probably not even the right term that has no bounds. So let's look at Isaiah 34 verse 11. This is some type of a bird and they don't even know what type of bird it is. But the, the cormorant, that's the King James Version, it's some kind of a a seagull or something. And the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it and shall stretch out upon its line of confusion and the stone of stones of emptiness. Can I just present to you that this verse right here pertaining to the stones of emptiness are, could be the stones that Lucifer once walked in the midst of that have lost their fire. When a, when a stone loses its flame, it becomes nothing but a buried brick. And it is only going to be used to build the facade of religious men's opinions and desires instead of the collective house of the creator himself. 
<clears throat> so let's see this, or let's hear this. And it shall stretch out upon this line, these stones of emptiness. Let's look at this. Confusion is the Hebrew word in Isaiah 34, 11, tohu. Don't, doesn't the scripture say the creator is not the author of confusion? An author is what? The one who created a writing. So if he's not the author of confusion, he is not the one who created the void. It makes sense when you look at the Bible and you just define it by scripture. The term bohu is connected to stones that are bohu, empty and lacking divine power and kingdom purpose. It is no coincidence that the value of the Hebrew phrase found in Jeremiah 4.23 is equivalent to another phrase I'm going to get to in just a minute. Let's go to verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was, it was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light. The words form and void, both in the same order, are tohu vabohu again. I'm getting somewhere. I just got to build this type of foundational thing to get you to think about some stuff. It's the same phrase, the same order, tohu vabohu, found in Genesis 1-2 in regards to the earth becoming tohu vabohu. With these insights, this can also be read as this. To attack the weakest point of a body by removing the shlach, the, apost the apostolic anointing or the sent out building ability given by Abba himself. Remove the place that we return to is what the enemy wants to do. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the value of this phrase is connected of lazan, lazanav, excuse me, shalach, is equivalent to the Hebrew phrase vayit chabe, which means, and they continue to hide themselves. When I was studying this part here, I was in tears because I was trying to visualize Adam and, and, and the woman. And Adam and the woman, not to say, oh, pobrecito, you know, we're, we're messed up, what happened, or whatever, you know, not, not to do any of that kind of stuff, but to just look at it from a point of view. Man has always desired to be embraced and cuddled and covered, no matter how tough he seems to be. Mankind has always desired to be covered with Ahava, the love of Abba. He does, no matter how strong. I've ministered to guys from prison, you name it. Deep down inside that hard shell, there is a tender heart. All men, soldier, prisoner, you name it, the toughest men, all of them need some kind of desire. Man has always desired to be covered. So this phrase that is equivalent to tohu, to, excuse me, to this phrase that is equivalent to the lezanav shelach is equivalent to what's found in Genesis 3 8, where Adam and the woman, after the fall, hid themselves. The removal, let's go back to these stars. The removal of one third of the stars is the act of showing the nakedness and fear that comes with this and the resistance of rectifying the fall of the man called Adam. To remove the fiery stones is to disrupt the heavenly pattern we have been given in the heavens above, also known as the 12 cycles of fire. And it gets even more interesting because the root of this Hebrew word found in Genesis 3.8, vahit chabe, is the word chaba. And it's a verb meaning to secrete body fluid or waste. It's the action of hiding someone or something from sight. So you can probably imagine that Adam and the woman for the first time in fear as they went looking to be covered in El Shaddai, but that could no longer be anymore because they fell from grace. They fell from their position. They were seeking a covering and all they could do was see their body fluids begin to discharge for the first time because of fear. They were afraid for the first time when all this time they were dwelling in the presence. They were dwelling in the presence of the Most High. Another family word to this phrase in which Adam and Eve, what they were doing, it, it reveals a little more insight. So not only did they go to, they were seeking a, a, a covering, but there could, there was no such covering created for sin at that time. None. 
And there would never be until the king priest would manifest in the flesh and step foot out of the Jordan River. I believe that when he stepped foot out of the Jordan and hit the, the lands of Jerusalem, the anointing came on him for the first time while in the Jordan. So when he stepped foot, every demonic entity was put on notice. Every leper bondage, the bondage behind the leprosy was put on notice. Every bleeding womb was put on notice. Every sickness and disease was put on notice. Everything contrary to the kingdom of the Most High was put on notice of what? The king priest of Eden came to restore the Adamic priesthood through the venue of the Melech order of things. It's above Melchizedek. He came to restore an Adamic race with the anointing of Kohenim. And we want to argue over the who's a Levite and who's not. Who's the son of Aaron and who's not. Well, I'm a Melchizedek priest. That's bigger than that. That's why he's of the order of the Melech Sadiq. He's not the Melech Sadiq. If we can say that, in a sense he is, but he's above that. That limits him. He's above. The Melech Sadiq does what? It eliminates family feuds and battles. And that's what you see happening in Genesis 14. Why did Melchizedek come out of the city of Salem, king of Salem? Because Abram and his family were having a war. It was a family feud, and Melchizedek, comes, he steps in to diffuse the feud and unite the family. And that's what Melchizedek does. He comes to diffuse the feud, unite the family through his blood. So this other re related word is the Strong's number. I don't like doing this because for me it's... No, let me just behave. I'll give it just in case someone needs it. Because I start going and going and going. But it's a Strong's number 22, Hebrew Strong's number 2245. This word comes from another Hebrew word called Chavav or Chabab. The first Chabab. No, I'm just kidding. Chabab or Chavav. It means to love. Only found one time in all of Scripture. And it's found in the temple scroll of called Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 33 verse 3, when yod heh vav -He is taking his time to express the love he has for his people. Imagine that, the creator sitting on his throne, speaking to his prophet, and expressing to him how much he loves this wayward people. How many of us can say that? That's tough, huh? So this makes perfect sense when we connect the scripture. The root of this word is chov. It's the word for bosom. So Adam and the woman were seeking the protective shelter of El Shaddai, the bosom of the Most High. You see, when a sinner comes back from the battlefield, they're like a child all over again. The first thing they need to do is suck, if I no disrespect, upon the breast of El Shaddai to nourish what they've been through, to nourish them because they've come in from the battlefield of sin. So the creator says the first encounter you must have is you need to be nourished. We've got to strengthen the inner man now. So you've got to attach yourself to the bosom of yod heh vav -He, which is El Shaddai. And El Shaddai, he says, I'm not going to wait for men to come running to me. I'm going to go down there with them. And it's as if he tore out his bosom and manifested that in the flesh. <laughs> the heart of Abba. The heart of Abba. I want every Jewish man and woman to hear me, every rabbi, every Christian, every non-believer. The heart of Abba is Israel. The heart of Abba is Yisrael. It is his people. And his people are to inherit the land of Israel promised to Abraham. The heart of Shabbat is the celestial balance of the cosmos, returning the unbroken order of time and eternity back to its initial point of a complete cycle circle of 360. Bam. So let's look at some verses here. One that everyone should know. John 3.16. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but possess 
everlasting life. For he so loved the world, you guys, the whole world. He's not talking about the earth. He created the earth for the ones whom he loves so much. You see, you'll create an environment for the ones you love with all your life. You will do your best to create the perfect environment for those whom you love with the best of your ability. So let's look at world. He so loved the world. Isaiah 45 verse 17 says, Israel shall be saved. In yod he vav he with an everlasting salvation, you shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Israel is like a world with no end. For Elohim so loved the world without end that he gave his son. He so loved Israel that when he came and said, you know what, I'm not waiting for you to come to me. I'm going to come to you first and I will draw all men unto myself as you lift up the bosom of Abba. <laughs> Ephesians 3.21 says this, Unto him be glory where? In the congregation or in my house? Well, this should reflect what's going on in your house. By Mashiach, you could tell who is a son and daughter of the Most High. If there is something that bugs you about anything or anyone on the planet, go straighten it out. Remember, the battle's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. we got to get that in our head. It's not against those who have blood flowing through their veins. It's beyond that. No matter how much you dislike whoever, that's not the battle. If the enemy can get you zeroed in on them, he can keep you distracted. The ones you're focused on the most is your distraction. Adam and the woman both hid themselves from the voice that walked in the ruach of the day. What Adam was doing here was trying to return to the bosom that once comforted him. Loved him, imparted wisdom to him, provided for him, protected him, trusted him to regulate the earth realm and the celestial realm. Adam was to be the schoolmaster to all that had become chaotic and empty. Adam was to repair this void of dominion. But Adam chose another way. He gave heed to another voice that spoke in the, in the garden. Adam is the prodigal son that left Abba's house that Mashiach was speaking about. And now that all is spent, man is wanting to come home again. Man is wanting to come home again. Can I just come home? Abba says, not yet. Not yet. Man desires to come home. Mashiach in all he taught was always referring back to the fall and man's condition as to what it is now. We went from the first high king priest, what is known as Adam Rishon, or the first man. He was to establish an Adamic Kehuna priesthood here on the earth. Because cause righteousness to sprout forth like a shoot of a plant, as the, as the prophet says. Bringing in the king's dominion here on the earth. Adam failed, so the creator in his infinite wisdom inserted the plan long ago. How else could we have a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth if he did not have a plan? You think he's surprised by it? He's not surprised by it. He had a plan before we were even planned. We are to return to the place of enclothement in the bosom of El Shaddai. How many people are satisfied with the bodies you live in right now? I'm not. If we had to spend... I heard a guy say this. I'm going to say it. He said, if I have to spend eternity in, in heaven in this body, please send me to hell. Like, you better watch what you say, brother. You better be grateful for what you got. No, you won't spend eternity in that one, but you will. If you reject through that type of language, you will. So we see Abba is doing a great work. Exodus 28, verse 30. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. When he goes in before yod heh vav -Heh, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before yod heh vav -Heh continually. The Urim and the Thummim is also a reference to Israel as the sons of light and the sons of righteousness. Pay attention to this. Hopefully you were researching things I gave you. You could see this in the community rule. 
You could see it in First Enoch. You could see it in the Temple Scroll, which is the real Deuteronomy book that should be in our scriptures because they took out some pages. The Blessing Scroll, the Mixat Maaseh HaTorah, those are the, the workings and the writings of the Torah, the Ezekiel Apocalypse, and the War Scroll. You could see all of this truth in there. The Urim and the Thummim are tangible evidence of our celestial bodies that reflect the 12 chariots or the 12 merchavot in the sky known as the celestial bodies that many call the zodiac. So it's no coincidence that the Urim begins with the Aleph and the Thummim begins with the Tav, both forming the Aleph Tav or which represents the word of Yah who brings perfection and who brings light to a dark world. That's called righteousness. The battle between the breastplates is the bringing back of the prodigal son called Adam and creation. Creation is part of the fall of the prodigal son. Ultimately, if you look at a prodigal son in scripture or even in your life, you look at a prodigal son, it is a reflection of, of, a reflection of the first fall. You're prodigal because your father was a prodigal. And everyone born into this world, as cute as babies are, everyone born into this world is born in as a prodigal son. We have to make our journey back home. Adam, he holds the key to unlocking the power of the 12 part celestial body which is in the heavenly template of earth's Israel by the combination balance of the numbers 3, 6, and 9 that unlock these things. I think I mentioned it last week, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla, very intelligent man. He created so many things, had so many countless patents and things he created didn't even get patented and they were, he just had a mind on him. He was infused. He had mentioned, he says, you want to know the secrets of the entire cosmos and universe universe comprehend the numbers three six and nine how many people have done that I haven't done that I haven't even attempted to do that it's just mind staggering when this takes place when all is restored by the last Adam all calendar issues will come to a rest when the walking celestial body called Israel here on earth returns to the bosom of El Shaddai called Yod Hey Vav Hey Yahushua HaMashiach our high priest and king if these stones could talk the Mashiach said the things they would say So think about this very truth. Why would the enemy desire to remove the very heart of Abba? The heart of Abba is his Shabbat, and the heart of the Shabbat is the celestial bodies in which the heart of, the, the heart of Abba, his people, are to reflect the very thing. So he could become, this is why, so he could become the one that all creation loves and desires and worships. The enemy desire to be worshipped. Worship is the biggest thing in the spirit realm. Even in the natural realm, kings desire people to pay homage to them and to worship them. The king of kings desires for all creation to worship him. All creation. And guess what? According to the scriptures, all creation will bow before him. If you're struggling in a sinful action and you think just by walking through the doors on Shabbat or uh, walking in the doors in a Sunday service, don't mock the creator. You're going straight to hell in your sin if you think you can hide that sin. If you're living an alternative lifestyle that is not pleasing to the creator, not me, forget me, not Pastor Dave, not anyone, Lotto, anybody in here, nobody, that is not pleasing to the creator and it is a full out rebellion, you're going to burn in hell, whatever that looks like, I don't know. He ain't playing games. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pike. Why? Because the nine portals have been tampered with. They've been fornicating with the stargates that were forbidden. And at the other side of them stargates are these Malachim warriors that we don't want coming here on the earth that mythological movies declare as the titans and so on and so forth. You see it all in the movies. The real titans are the ones enchained in Tartarus, the deepest parts of hell we don't even imagine. If one of them were unleashed, it would destroy the planetary systems. But I believe that they're breathing heavy. You know why they're breathing heavy? Because man has tampered with the forbidden. So these things have been waking up and they're beginning to breathe again. They're beginning, there's a movement happening. Why do you think so much is happening around the entire planet? So much is happening. 
So he wants this so that people will worship him. Lucifer, the light bearer. In Ezekiel 28, it's written that Lucifer, the light bearer, wanted to sit in the midst. He wanted to sit in the midst. He's always trying to get in the midst. Always trying to batoch. He's always trying to get right in the midst of things to influence. He's always trying to drill a hole in a plant. He's always trying to poke a hole, drill a hole in a boat that's out in the ocean. He's always trying to cause something to sink and fail. Because his plans are the same and they never come to its fulfillment of kingdom. It's always the opposite. So just a thought of mine. The Hebrew rendering for this phrase to sit in the midst of is yashavti belev in Hebrew. Which if you look at this word, yes, it's related to Moshev, Yashev, Yashav. It means to sit and whatnot. But I like the way they have this rendered right here. It's as if he wants to sit in the heart of Sabbath. The enemy who desires to sit in the heart of Shabbat. That's why he, wants, he wanted to sit in the congregation of the north in the midst of Sabbath, in the heart of Sabbath, the enemy wants to take your Shabbat and get you to look at Shabbat as less than going to McDonald's, as less than going to Starbucks, as less than playing, as, as less than playing a, a, a sport or a game or whatnot. And I'm not trying to judge anybody that does any of those things. I'm just saying his Shabbat should be rendered high above anything else that you do during the week. And I'm just going to say this is whatever you observe the most is what you're worshiping, period. That's the truth. What you spend the time with, what you spend your time with the most is what you love more than anything else. Just calculate your 24 hours a day. Just if you're working, discard work for a minute because, you know, you got to do what you got to do there. But after work and before work, what is your schedule like? We all got 24 hours in a day. Are you a worshiper at home or is it just a facade on Shabbat? Are you a, are you a praiser at home or is it just a facade at Shabbat? Is all hell going, breaking loose at home? Praise yourself. Pray, praise Abba at home. Worship him and fall to your knees at home. If you do it there, you'll do it here. What you spend time with the most is what you love the most. And some people, you should get excited. If you're frowning, if you're mad, you're only mad at yourself because you're, you're telling on yourself. What you spend time with the most is what you are loving the most. Me and my wife have been married this year 27 years and we spend every day with each other. What you love the most, you spend your time with. It's not like, oh, I got, I, hopefully I, I, I have the time to do it. No, no, no. Make time. Make time. The, the creator allowed us to create things, and one of those is creating our own time. You know, you can create your own time in your midst. You create your own time in your midst. You create your own time in your midst. What constituted Shabbat in the first temple era? Not the second temple era, which was, I used this word, I made it up, harlotized. That's not even a word, but I just threw it in there because it seems smart. It was the rising of the sun. This is what constituted Shabbat in the first temple. You can read it. Was the rising of, 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 of the sun. That's when Shabbat began, the first break of light. Notice this Hebrew phrase that we have here up above. Lucifer desired to sit in the heart of Sabbath. He desires to make his dwelling in the very heart of Shabbat. The heart of Shabbat is the central point that connects the people to Abba. It is the connecting point between the people of Yah to his 12 signs in the heavens, also known by the world, as I mentioned before, the Zodiac. Now remember, astrology, you should not go and try to delve into the astrological insights and revelation that is mixed with Satanism. But there is the study of the stars called astronomy. Study the celestial bodies. And that's what the patriarchs did of old. They didn't have the computers like we have here. They stood out in the deserts, looked at the stars, taught their sons and daughters the formations of prophetic times and whatnot. The Mashiach says, you religious Pharisees, you can tell the signs of the times, but you're lacking some other things. You're lacking a level of belief. 
the heart of Shabbat is the, ver- is the very heart of the Creator's calendar, which is hid until the appointed time of the end. We all have a Shab- we all have Sabbath down. Would you guys agree with that to a certain degree? You can make it extravagantly beautiful and or real simple. We all got it down, right? No, we don't. We got so much to learn about Shabbat. We think we've arrived. We don't have it all down. We don't. Priests were commanded to teach the people between the difference between what is sacred and what was profane. This is a job of a priest. You teach the people the difference between sacred and profane. What is clean and what is unclean. The priests were designed to bring judge, righteous judgment to the people so that they don't hurt themselves and go down the wrong way and destroy their lives. What we see from the scrolls of Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48 was the possibility, listen, for heaven on earth. The sons of Zadok are appointed there. Specific sacred areas of Ezekiel's temple were for the line of Zadok. Yorhevav says this in Ezekiel 44 verse 15 to 28. They, were to tr- they had charge over the Levites even though they all come from Aaron's loins. This select status, just follow me for a minute. This select status of the Zadokai priests with their claim lineage from Aaron, Eliezer, and Pinchas. They were given charge in Ezekiel's vision for the covenants and the commandments of the Sabbath and the appointed times and seasons. Their names associated with justice and righteousness, light and integrity was a conventional ideal which left its imprints on the entire Qumran community of that day who subordinated themselves to the leadership of the Zadokites in the spirit of Ezekiel's vision and prophecy. They were convinced that their lineage descended from the historical house of Zadok himself. These details, you, can, you guys can go look in First Chronicles 1, Ezra 5, the book of Nehemiah, and before that time, 2 Samuel, 2 Kings. It reveals all of these truths. So now this distinguished line was believed to culminate with someone who was anonymous. Listen to this. This is all in the scrolls. The anonymous figure that orchestrated this righteousness was called the Moret Sedek, the teacher of righteousness within the Qumran community. Well, what do you know? The Mashiach, it is believed from his 12 years to 29 years old, which if you know Hebrew uh, uh, age, if you're 12, you, once, you, once 12 comes, you're really in the realm of 13. Once 29, you pass 29, and you the day after that, you're in the realm of 30. That's how that works. So there's a possibility of the Mashiach who was in the Qumran community during those 18 years. Learning and knowing of these things. And when he was down there, it's all in the Qumran uh, scrolls. And, and, and a scroll, a cave 4 and cave 11. There was a man that people were calling More Tzedek, the righteous teacher. One called him a high priest king. It, it's, it was in there. This was referring to the Mashiach himself. And you can find this in 4Q171 and so on and so forth. We're moving along. <clears throat> The people of Qumran called themselves the house of righteousness, therefore making claim to bear the sacred, listen to me, the sacred space, the sacred place, the sacred calendar, you can check this stuff out, the sacred sacrifice, the sacred song, the sacred soul, and they called the sacred land space. And being the sacred priest, the tradition of the first temple in the house of King David. These were the righteous ones preparing the way in the wilderness. Does that sound familiar? This was the very priesthood that ministered until the Hasmonean period. The Qumran community kept and preserved detailed information of genealogies. And you can see some of this in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. Up to the first temple destruction. They kept, the, they kept noting down the genealogical connections to the families. The priestly dynasty of the house of Tzadok came to a tragic end in the 70s and between the 70s and 60s before the common era. The high priest Simeon II, also known as Simeon the Just, had two sons, the high priest Onias III, who succeeded him, and the latter's brother Joshua-Jason, that's his name, who aspired to usurp the post and position of his brother. 
When Antiochus IV Epiphanes came to power in 175 before the Common Era, Jason, an advocate of Hellenization, bribed the Seleucid ruler to appoint him as high priest out instead of his brother Ananias and officiated in the capacity between 175 and 172 before the Common Era. I have to give you some history here. Is that okay? I don't know about you guys. I love history. How many people love history? Be honest. Keep your hand down if you don't. It's okay. But you're getting it even if you don't love it because it's here. There was a man also, Jason in turn, was displaced by a man named Menelaus. How many people have seen the movie Troy? You see the names they use in there, Helen, Helena, all, all this stuff is connected to scriptural stuff. Remember the Spartans? How many people remember the Spartans? Were they bad to the bone or what? They were Israelites. They weren't, from, they weren't actually Spartans. They come from the lineage of Israel. They were warriors, 300 men from Israel, but that's part of being scattered to the nations. Most of the, the brains today are quote-unquote Jewish people, the nuclear bomb created by Jewish people, so on and so forth. And I want to throw you guys, I'm, I'm a history buff with a lot of stuff. I read a lot of law books too, a lot of, lot of things I read. But you know that when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, do you know the President of the United States had to go to the post, Postmaster General of the United States for permission for him to put a stamp on each one of the bombs and autograph over them. And then what did he say? Send the mail to Hiroshima. You, you can check that out. I come from a family of military. I know what I'm talking about, even beyond what they've shared with me. There's so much that we just don't know. Is this okay, you guys? Hopefully you're learning. Are you learning something? Hopefully you are. I pray you are. I really do. But Menelaus, as high priest, cooperated with the desecration and Hellenization of the temple. That's why the Messiah had such a problem with that second temple era. He went up, it says, to the synagogue on the temple mount. Not into the holy place or that sacred space, supposedly, it's supposed to be sacred, but they defiled it. He didn't go inside of there. He read scrolls from the synagogue. He already knew his time had not yet come. He wasn't in agreement with what was going on. These were descendants of Menelaus and some of the Greeks that were dressed up as sons of Aaron, and history proves it. I know I won't get a whole lot of friends with that, but remember, I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to make enemies either. But just you won't be really liked with certain things if you don't go with the flow of the dead. Uh, if you don't go with the flow of the rest of the fish, right? You're not going to be liked. You got you to gotta swim upstream. Let all the dead fish keep going downstream. You swim upstream like a salmon that's not farm raised. And you keep on going till you hit that place. From this point on, the influential deception from Antiochus Epiphanes that Daniel chapter 7 references of changing times and seasons. Daniel chapter 7 is a reference to what Antiochus Epiphanes did. He came to change observances and times. You can please read this. Antiochus Epiphanes, what did he do? He forced the believers, the sons of Aaron and other Israelites of that time to offer up sacrifices of pork and unclean things on the altar to defile it for Force them to eat or die, all these types of things. The Antiochus IV is a picture of the anti-Messiah that will one day come and offer up profane things on the altar of the Most High. Where's the altar of the Most High? It's called the Mountain of Moriah. That's the whole altar. The entire area is a gigantic altar. Could it be that the Antichrist, according to the book of Revelation, that the souls that are brought by a mighty angel, Malachim, a a warrior of some sort, a giant messenger, could the souls that had the prayers of the saints in it in that jar be poured out on the earth, could that be the sacrifice mutilation that the anti-Messiah had done killing believers under the mountain area? There's a possibility that that will happen. This is a shocker. I like the faces. But it's good. I'm here to, to challenge you guys. I really am. I come to challenge you in a loving manner. I'm here. You know, I came here to provoke you guys. Is that okay? Oh, that's a sin. You're not supposed to provoke. No, the scripture commands us to provoke. To provoke to love. We're to provoke you to listen to what Abba has to say. That's true, Ahava. Love, according to scripture, is doing what Abba says to do. 
The fear of Abba, you know what the fear is? It's real simple. It's, not, it's, it's like, man, thank you, Abba, for making it easy for us. Men make it hard. Love is doing what he says to do. The fear of Abba is when he says, don't do something, you don't do it. That means you fear him. Why? Because there's an impending judgment of some sort. Whether you stick your finger in that socket, you get electrocuted, or you say, you know what? I'm not under the laws anymore. I'm going to cross this red light. And guess what's going to happen? A semi is going to run your butt over. You're going to be a pancake. So fear is not doing what he says not to do. Love is doing what he says to do. It's, it's, it's pretty easy. You don't need any pastor, rabbi, no one to tell you, to teach you that. It's just open it up, what he says to do, just do it. And watch what happens. That's it. So from this point on, this, there was an influence from Antiochus Epiphanes that seeped into the heart of Israel and the very temple itself. What was once a Zadokai priest became history as they were replaced by Antiochus IV for a paid charlatan. The Hasmoneans had taken over the entire priesthood, even to the days of Mashiach when he walked on the earth. They came, that's why he says, you brood of vipers. John the Baptist, the true last high priest of Aaron's lineage, he said, you, you nest of snakes, who told you to come out here? Prove your fruits of teshuvah. Show us the fruits of the Ruach HaKodesh in your life. Show us the fruits of your repentance, that you have returned to the ways of Yah. Because John, he probably, Yohanan Hamatbil probably says, that ephod and those priestly garments belong to me. You're not fooling anybody. I'm supposed to be wearing those. Let's look at Lucifer's breastplate here. I think I went over those already. Let's get into this here. <clears throat> Ezekiel, we're going to look at this for a second. Excuse me, Exodus 28. It says this, verse 9 and 10. And you shall take the two onyx stones. Those are two shoulder stones. Six of names of Israel on one, six on the other. That's what the high priest would carry Israel into the sacred place on his shoulders. He would carry. The, the yoke of the high priest was easy. Why? He did all the work. He carried the burden for us. And that's why the Mashiach says, take upon you my yoke, for it is easy and my burden is light. You cannot carry the load of redemption. It's too big for you. No priest was ever able to do it. So the stones were written according to their birth. So I want to try to connect these things here. So we have two dominant views. We have the nativity of the 12 sons order, or we have the encampment placements, but follow me real, real quick here. The encampment speaks of the restored order of the celestial bodies and therefore the restored calendar of our creator, which has been distorted even before the fall of Adam. So the encampment is the creator saying the way you're encamped is a reflection of the celestial bodies. So when you get that done here and you get that correct, those up there will do exactly what they did before, which was to release a heavenly aura to where you're not going to need the the light of the sun, the light of the moon. Why? Because the presence of the king will be in your midst. But you got to get this down right. The other view is the order of movement in the desert. Adam was formed to restore the dominion of our creator here on earth and even the celestial bodies. How was he supposed to do this? We couldn't even figure out the totality of what that means. But if creation itself is groaning and moaning and waiting for the manifestation of the sons of Elohim, then we as the stones, the living stones of Elohim, we must get some things in order. In order to begin, pun intended, I guess, or no, no pun intended, in order to begin to even grasp the complexity of this study, we must try and connect a couple of these stones that we have. So let's look at this for a minute. And I could not, there's no way I pulled all that out. I went into the stones and I saw some very interesting things with a lot of stuff I'm going to leave out. I was instructed to leave it out and I'm going to be obedient. I was instructed to leave that out. I won't even go into it. So let's look at the three stones that are missing from Lucifer's breastplate, and it's pretty insightful. If I could at least give you this, this is going to be an encouraging thing to keep you standing in what Abba says. 
So the three stones are the, the jacinth, the, the agate, and the amethyst. In Hebrew, the jacinth is leshem, or losh, loshem, leshem, it's really leshem. And it has an unknown origin. If you go to the, the, what seems like a forgotten language, the Akkadian, you go, you, the Ugar, I think it's Ugarian or something like that, some, some Ugaritic, Ugaritic language. I saw some of the Sumerian writings, like if we can read Sumerian, oh yeah, let me just turn the page, oh yeah, that says this, it's just very, it looks like arrows, their, their language, the way they connect them. But these languages refer to some interesting names for the stones, but I don't know how, how concrete that is, but let's look at this. So even though this Leshem has a, an unknown origin for this type of stone, what we do have is a phrase screaming in our face, which says this, Leshem can mean to the name, to the authority. So the first stone the enemy does not have is the one that leads you to the name. He does not want you to come to the name. Why do you think we did what we did last week with the marker codes, the placement codes? A garment called the Greek language was covering the sacred name of the Most High, preserving it for us so that we can look at these truths today. So the enemy does not want you to, to be directed towards the name. Why? Because the name of yod heh vav -Heh is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and we are safe. He does not want you to have that. The next stone is the agate. Well, before we get to the agate, so the deception of the enemy he uses with this stone is to make people think that they can obtain riches, health, and beauty through his venue before making the spirit rich, making the spirit man healthy, making the spirit man and the attitude beautiful. It's the opposite. The enemy tries to distract us with the outside first. When you try to build the outside, the inside will never look like the outside. The inside is going to be void and empty even though the outer shell is painted like a pretty barn. The agate is called shvu in Hebrew. It's from an unused word, unused root. It's just they're, they're, they're trying to capture this mysterious thing. So there's a language we don't even know that can probably communicate this, that we haven't heard the angels' language. There's, a, there's the, the language of men, and then there's the language of the malachim, the angelic beings. There's a heavenly language that we don't comprehend. But this comes from an unused uh, root, probably identical with that of another Hebrew word. You can look it up, Strong 7616. And it's through the idea or the subdivision of flashes or streamers of light or meaning flashes of flame or like to sparkle. So the shvu, the agate, speaks of the flashes of light and flame. It is as if we have I'm getting ahead of myself. No, I almost gave you guys something I'm not supposed to yet. I'm sorry. Ah, sorry. Hallelujah. I will keep going with this. Man. So this word is also related to another word, shaviv. Say shaviv. It means to split into tongues of fire. Didn't we just have shavuot? So the agate, the center stone, is the one that deals with returning repentance because shuv is in there. Shvu means I will return to him. To who? The one who dispatched the tongues of fire on top of my head. When? On Shavuot, after he resurrected. I'm going to return. So the enemy... He wants to fight against the gifts of the Spirit and continue to, to defile the way they're supposed to be operated and function. Yeah, you can't speak in tongues because that's a demonic tone. No, tongues is for today. There's the language of men and of angels. There are ancient writings connected to the book of Numbers chapter 11 saying that the, that the Creator grabbed a portion of Moshe's Spirit and smeared it on the people, the leaders of Israel, and it says they nabai. The nabai is, is, is connected is the word for prophesying, but it also means to speak in a language that is unknown to you. You've been anointed to just speak. So the enemy says, you better believe it. I don't want you coming close to the name, and I definitely don't want you fire baptized in, my, in the spirit of the Almighty, because then you won't even comprehend the voice that's coming from me. So i got to keep you from those two things so far. So the third stone is called the amethyst. 
In Hebrew, it's called achlama. Achlama. Like I said, you guys want more details? It's another time. Go talk to Nitza Moshe and others that are, are more expertise on stones. I'm not an expert on stones, but I do do a little bit of study on them. So they are fascinating to me. Achlama. And I want to encourage you guys, go look on your own time. You're going to need a few different Hebrew dictionaries. Break this word down. You're going to be shocked. I can give you this. It's something that took me down a Pandora box. Just this one alone. I had to leave it be. It would have been a whole other direction we'd be going. So it's just fascinating. But Achlama, this is called the dream stone. Each one of the stones contains the totality of its inference. What it is inf influencing you of and why it was created. A purple type of stone, purple is a royal color. Our Mashiach wore a purple seamless priest coat. The tabernacle had what? B had uh, uh, blue, had red, had purple, and had white. While blood is red, that speaks of the flesh of man. Blue speaks of a heavenly realm. So when you combine red and blue, just have the children do it. Get two colors, red and blue, color them together. You got purple. When you combine, when you see the eternal one put on the blood, it becomes becomes a royal canopy. It becomes a royal priesthood. It becomes a royal anointing. It becomes the anointing to fulfill the work of deliverance and salvation to bring the people back to the Most High. Hopefully this is making a little bit of sense. Mashiach wore this purple coat. You can find it in John chapter 19. This word... Achlama comes from the word chalam, which means to be healthy, to recover, to be strong. And it means to dream. As in Jacob's ladder, when he had a dream, he saw the chalam. Sulam, excuse me. He saw the sulam. He saw the ladder, but he had a chalam. A dream. And chalam is also the name of a vowel pointing. I won't get into with the Hebrew language means to be healthy, to dream, to be strong, to recover. What was this revelation given to Yaakov? It was the future revelation of the 12 tribes. The temple mount, the house of the king being healed, restored, recovered from the chaos and emptiness. The divine order revealed here on earth was heaven's template reflecting from here up there to up there. So the enemy doesn't, does not have the jacinth, the agate, and the amethyst stones. Why? Because the one deals with those who will have the fortitude like Gad. Gad is, wherever Gad is placed, he expands a tribe. Gad is a headhunter. Gad don't play around. Gad is one. If you say, hey, you know, we need to go take out this enemy before you can finish your sentence, he's already walking two steps ahead of you. So that the, en the, the, the enemy knows that the tribe of Jad, excuse me, Gad, see, I'm getting excited, the tribe of Gad deals with Lashem, leading people in an unstoppable power force to the name. Why? Because the name is the tower where to run and not some stargate tower of Babel that's being created again today. Trying to get you to run into that, to come on and run into that, and what? When you run into that, you just might lose your soul and become some kind of a hybrid chimera. Who knows? The three stones reflect, as I said, Gad, Asher, and Yisachar. When these names are combined, we have a Hebrew phrase called the one who goes into battle, lifts the contract payment, or satisfies the debt. So the enemy did not want these tribes' names or their stones. Why? Because the one who comes, he comes into the battle, he lifts the payment contract that was over our head, and he fulfills the debt, and he leads the people to the name, he leads the people to repentance, and he leads the people to the very heart and presence and the anointing of the Most High. According to Ezekiel, Zechariah, can I keep going for a little bit more? Is that okay? All right, good. According to Ezekiel, Zechariah, the Gospels, Acts, Hebrews, Revelation, the Community Rule, the DJD, look at all these, the Psalm Scroll, the Apocryphon of Ezekiel, Jubilees, Damascus Document, the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, very powerful, and several other books. There is now a Tohu Vabohu since 70 of the Common Era. All these books 
proclaim this truth. There has been tohu vabohu on the earth again since the destruction of the temple. But I want to just convey to you guys the tohu vabohu took place in the second temple when Antiochus, the, the counterpart, came in and changed everything. It became tohu vabohu. How do you know? Because in the Holy of Holies was a stone altar. The Ark of the Covenant was gone. There was no more nothing in there. In the book of Ezekiel, you see a replacement of everything. There's no more court of the Gentiles. Why? Because Mashiach came and destroyed that wall that separated lost sheep of Israel from coming in to meeting with their brother Judah. Joseph and Judah kissing each other on the cheek, embracing one another. Why? Because the son of the right hand, Benjamin, he kept the cup of salvation in his bosom. It created an empty space on the mountain, an empty priesthood with no authority or power to impact the nation. What we have is the prodigal son returning from the gates, all 12 of them. 12 stones versus 9 stones. Lucifer desired to sit in the congregation in the north or hidden place so he would descend with it in as the book of Revelation said. He wanted to come down with his bride called the New Jerusalem as if that was going to happen and rule and reign on the earth. But the Mashiach says, no, I'm coming for my wife. I'm coming for my bride. You are no longer going to abuse her. You are no longer going to take advantage of her. You are no longer going to run her through the mud and the muck and the mire as a prostitute. I don't care what she's done because my blood speaks that of things better than Abel. I'm not coming to judge her. I'm coming to purchase her back. I'm coming to redeem my wife, my bride, Israel. So Satan, you get your hands off of my queen. Get your hands off of Israel. Israel belongs to the Most High. I don't care how many sons and daughters called religions of the world you want to bring forth, devil. The enemy, you have been defeated. John 4 verse 8 says, For this purpose was the Son of Elohim manifest that he would destroy the works of the enemy. For this purpose our Mashiach was lifted up by the hatred of the enemy and through the hands of sinful men only to draw close to him the sons and daughters of Israel that have been scattered abroad. He says, I need you to line up again. I need you to come within the circumference of gold. I need you to come into the circumference of gold and purity, untampered with, untainted with. I got a new name for you. I know what people have been calling you all your life, but I got a whole new name for you. A new name no one's ever heard before. A name that the heavens heard, but no one on the earth. A name that's recognized in the corridors of heaven. A name that is stamped in sealed in your DNA, and I will come to speak it forth in a future time closer than what you think. I don't know where that came from. It just jumped out of my spirit. I didn't even realize I was standing here. I'm not even kidding. <sighs> Hallelujah. You guys want me to stop? Okay, I'm going to go. Can I go till 2.30? I just want to make sure I don't lose anyone. If you're tired, if, if you're 4 o'clock, I love it. If you get tired, I need you to come stand up here with me. Now, trust me, I'm not intimidated. I'm not, I'm not bashful. Stand. If you're tired, get your flesh up here. The anointing is going to break that sluggishness. Because I came in tired. I, I came in, everyone said, how are you doing? I'm tired. I came up here, tired was history. I'm never tired up here. It's just, it's just got to get that flesh in line, right? You little flesh. Always messing with me, little old flesh. You're going to line up. Like Dave says, tell your flesh. Get your flesh by the neck and say, hey, I'm going to pray to him today. <laughs> Just do it. Get him. Get your flesh in order. Come on. Shake it around. I've seen a whole bunch of you now. Now the place is filled. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to do that again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we actually got a pretty packed house here. Those of you that are watching, we pray that Abba is blessing you right where you're at. So let's go back to the three stones. What was lacking from Lucifer's breastplate was the ability to do three things, which was what? This is so broad. I have, there's so much in here. You guys do your own study. Please, Abba, show him that you are interested in what he's showing us in scripture. But here's the three things that Lucifer was lacking the ability to do. Number one was to lead people to the name of yod heh vav -Heh. The name was over the head of Mashiach when he was crucified. They nailed it. 
Over his head, yod he wah he yod he vav he was over his head. So what, what does that mean? That means yod he vav he was standing over the sun as the blood was being shed. And as the blood was being shed, the holiness of the creator was tempered. The holiness, the, excuse me, the judgment of the creator was tempered. The holiness and the mercy of the creator had been gushing out what we thought was just trickles of a little bit of water. That was the mercy of the creator, the loving kindness being poured out and the blood was a witness there to tell people because of my blood I am pouring you out living waters to heal your wounds to deliver you and set you free to immerse you in me to immerse you in the name over my head the second thing the enemy lacks and I'll probably stop right here there's a stone get the notes and go through them I, I, I pray that Abba bless you with it the second thing the enemy was limited to do was to lead the people to repentance. See, repentance is a game changer. When you make teshuvah repentance, it is not a one-time thing. Repentance is a lifestyle. You're returning to the Father every day. If you stumble, don't stay there and cry. Get your booty up and keep on going. Confuse the enemy. Keep on going if you stumble. Get up. Get up. Like we did the other way. Walk. Walk in the ways of Abba. Stay on that narrow path. Just stay on the path. Stay on the path and don't move off no matter how windy it gets. Don't be afraid to cry out to Abba and tell him to strengthen you for the journey. Why? Because our strength, I'm weak. I knew a brother from the railroad when I was on the railroad, Noah, awesome brother, Noah Sanchez, such a humble, humble man, been through hell in his life. And he shared something with me I always repeat, I can't help it because it just ministered to me. Maybe it'll minister to somebody else. They asked him, Noah, what do you do when you pray to God? He said, you know what I do? In a humble way that he did, I can still hear his voice. He says this, you know what I said, Brother John? I say, ah, Father, you hold my hand because I'm not strong enough. I will let go. You hold my hand because I'll let go. I need your strength. Sometimes you need the Father's strength. Do you guys agree with that? So the enemy cannot lead people to repentance. He leads people to rebellion, not repentance. Number three, he does not have the ability to lead people to be anointed in Mashiach in his priesthood. Notice the enemy was able to slither in others into the lineage of Aaron. But he could not, he cannot, wherever there's blood, the enemy can manipulate with that. But where there, whenever there's blood from a man to a son on the earth, when there's, there's the, 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 the blood that comes from earth, union between a man and a woman, but the blood of Mashiach comes from above. He even said, he says, my flesh is not of this earth. My flesh is from heaven. I'm the bread of heaven. So that means his body was ordained in the heavenly realms. That's like a mind twister right there when you start really looking at it. So notice the brief history of the line of Aaron during the days of Antiochus IV. How Satan crept in and took over the priesthood through the anti-anointed one. But in Mashiach, in the high priesthood, there is no access from any point for Satan to come in. Think about this very hard. The fiery stones he walked among were the nine gateways to the nine major realms, including our galaxy. Within our galaxy are the 12 main celestial bodies. There's like 40-something in the entire galaxy or something like that. I, I forget the number. But there's 12 main celestial bodies which have names and prophetic implications. The enemy, as of now, has access to our realm and time. So the enemy lacks these stones because, number one, he hates the name of the Creator. Why? Because the name of the Creator, as I said, is that strong tower for us to run in and be safe. The enemy can't lead people to repentance because he lacks the authority. He lacks the jurisdiction. He can only have what you give him. Listen to me, please. The enemy can only work with what you forfeit over to him. He'll try to come and, and, and sidetrack you. That happens. But he cannot dwell in your life unless you invited him in. He can't. He can't lead you to repentance because he lacks that authority. He lacks the jurisdiction, the power, the sovereignty of the Most High to administer redemption and the restoration of all things. He cannot do it. He's, he's limited. 
Even though Ezekiel reveals that Lucifer is the anointed cherub that covers, he still lacks the third stone which speaks of the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh. You can't anoint or fill with the very spirit of the Most High. You can't be filled with his spirit unless you are the king. You can't fill anyone with that spirit unless you are the king yourself. It's impossible. There's no access through these stones for the enemy. When we put the names together of the possible tribes and these stones that were connected to them, we have an interesting phrase through the numerical aspect between the tribes, which is this. I am he, yod He vav He yashua HaMashiach, who is now seated among 12 fiery stones. Wow. When you get the numbers of the tribes and you get these stones and you start putting these together, you have a powerful phrase that should excite you guys. All in the numerical expansion of the names. The breastplate of Mashiach is all 12 tribes who have filled the void and emptiness through unification and the return of the prodigal son known as mankind. When the earthly chariot known as the Merkava called the house of Judah and the house of Joseph line up. Then just as Ezekiel saw a wheel within a wheel, he, excuse, when he saw this wheel within a wheel, he saw the unified Israel, which yod heh vav -Heh will sit in our midst of praises too. You can only praise and worship the king together if you're unified as one. When this earthly chariot is unified, then the 12 celestial chariots will line back up and we will return to a 360-day calendar respectfully as was reflected in the beginning. So what we have is the requirement to do what? To keep the standard of holiness that yod heh -Vav -Heh has set for us in the commandments expounded upon and laid out for us in his Torah. If we do this, then we become a people set apart for holiness. And we will reflect our set apart Elohim. The command for the people of Yah is to be ye kadosh, for I am kadosh. I am set apart. I am holy, he says. You've got to be set apart. But not everybody does. Not everyone. In Exodus 25, 8, remember the scripture says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. You know, it's believed that the tabernacle itself was made in, a, in a, something like a combination between a dome and pyramid type shape, not square. It would reflect, which makes sense, the celestial order in the heavenlies. And what do you know? All the temples down here are rectangle. They're, they're rectangle shaped. They're not reflecting the heavenly order. Why? Because whenever, <laughs> I'm going to just say this, oh my gosh. Whenever you put something in a box, according to law, it does not exist. I'm going to. Whatever you put in a box, according to law, I know what I'm talking about, does not exist. Yep, anything in brackets, parentheses, a box. So what we have are temples that men were given in the forms of boxes. Why? Because the enemy sees that as it should have never been. He wants the order amongst the people which are called living stones. Let's move along. I just want to throw that at, at you guys. Genesis 2-7. And yod heh vav -Heh formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So if we look at this, the man was created from the ha -dama. You guys already know that. And if there were no vowel points, the scripture could have been read like this. That man was created from the ha -a -dome, from the resemblance. So we're thinking dirt. But remember, the Masorites put vowel markings in there. So there's a lot of words in Hebrew that can be mean something a little different. So we're safe to say these same letters without moving any letters around. Ha-adome means the resemblance. That means Adam was formed in the image resemblance of the creator. What's the creator? He's spirit. He's spirit. Hadome means the similitude, the resemblance to be similar to. The Adam was formed out of the resemblance or the similar of who yod heh vav -Heh is. 
After this, we see that trees, animals, life itself is revealed in the earth. The life force of create, uh, that was created, that created all things through the spoken word of Abba, if I can use that, that term, in the earth came forth from the Adome of the Adam. I'm going to move ahead here because this, there's a lot in here. I know it can be uh, challenging. Let's move ahead. I want to show you guys some stuff. The Hadron Collider. I just wanted to show, hopefully there's a picture up there. Right there. You, a lot of you guys have seen that, right? This is the Switzerland one. These are photos from a study I did, I think in 2015 or 14. I forget which year it was. But one of those, and the, the year before, whatever year that was, the day before Passover is where they started the engine up. Right before Passover, they started the CERN engine up. And the things that were happening, there are... There is information that when they started that up, an, a doorway opened immediately as soon as the, the atoms went around faster than the speed of light and then exploded with each other. The, an opening, they, they see there was a dark matter type uh, access point. They, it scared them to death. Something happened there. While well, man is still messing around and playing God. So if you see the Hadron Collider, how I have it up on, hopefully it's up on the screen. It's the Hebrew phrase, Hameitz Hadron. In Hebrew, that's, you would have to transliterate it in that fashion. We have seen connections to the coming crash economy, right? I'm not going to get all political, but I want to mention this. We've seen Jade Helm 15 and many other impending life changes. But the Hadron Collider can also be read as this. Listen. The reason why uh, that this is happening here. The Hadron Collider can be read as this, the accelerating a generation. Are we living in the, the times where gener this, our gener this is the fastest paced generation ever? Ever. No longer are they using uh, hydraulics with certain robots. They're using muscle for man. They're manipulating, they're using muscle from, from man to get the arms and legs and the bodies of robots to move a little more smooth. Not, not like this or anything, but smooth. To accelerate a generation. They're trying to bring an accelerated generation or a hybrid generation. There is the plans and the practice of AI, artificial intelligence, and we have the Tower of Babel also being built all over again. There's some strange, strange stuff. What is all this for? I'm going to try to find a, the Lucifer slide. Let's go ahead. I want to try to close in five minutes here. But there's also the uh, Mount Graham Observatory with the Lucifer uh, s scope. Have you guys went and checked that out? You know how powerful that thing is? They use that because they're trying to look at some supposedly planet. You guys heard of the new beer? I'm not here to talk about this. There's people, all these stuff out there. But they're trying to follow a certain planetary system coming our way. And the Lucifer uh, kaleidoscope, or not kaleidoscope, but uh, uh, telescope, excuse me. It stands for this, large binocular telescope, near-infrared utility with camera, integral field unit for extra galactic research, the Lucifer device, the eye of Lucifer. Interesting. Now, don't bash me for this, but in the Talmud, the sages wrote about the coming of Messiah in the year 2012. This is in the Talmud. And that he would return to Jerusalem, reveal himself to the rabbis to restore celestial orders and the orders on the earth. This is in the, this is in the Talmud. Later, when the altar would be established, it is stated that then he would reveal himself to the world. So for me, this sounds exactly like the coming of the anti-Messiah. The anti-Messiah is said to come when Israel will be alone and rejected, meaning when all nations have turned their back on this nation, we have come to the threshold of this very thing. And remember, I just mentioned about CERN being turned on just the year prior to that Passover. So let's move ahead. I want to close this thing. <clears throat> There's just so much here. I don't even know where to start. I'm going way ahead of Brittany right now. She's not even going to be able to keep up, so I'm just blasting through all these slides here. <sighs> okay, I'm going to go here. <clears throat> so think about this. There's another connection to the longitude, latitude of the Mount Graham Observatory, depending on if you're a flat earther or not. So I don't know. Wherever you are, that's for you. 
you got to calculate the, the, the longitude, latitude in different ways, I guess. I don't know, depending on who you are. But we see this. It has a reduced value of 26, the number of the set-apart name. They want to become a created yod heh vav heh, who is to connect to the fall of Adam, which he has done. Let's all stand up. I'm not going to go through all this. this. This is just, get the notes, you guys. But I want to tell you guys this. I want to share this with you. Is there is a battle, and it's in here. There's so much in here. There is a battle going on for our soul, for the soul of man, for, for mankind, period. And we need to prayerfully, prayerfully ask Abba for complete direction, and it begins right here in us. The enemy is after the, after the woman. You saw in the book of Revelation, it says he stands before her, waiting for her to bring forth her children so he can devour them. Well, we see the enemy is making his devouring movements today on multiple levels, but we need to get some stuff straightened out right here with us, you watching us in here. So I want to I close in a word of prayer. And can we get any of the worship teams? I just want those of you, if it's all of you or some of you, only those of you that are sensitive to the Ruach HaKodesh, I want you to run up here. If the worship team is still here that was up there, let's run up here. Are you still here or did you guys leave? One of you. Come on, guys. You don't worship up here. You got to stay all the way to the end. Let's stay committed to Abba, not to, to a man. Come on, because things can shift. Let's get, let's get a, a worship team up there for a minute. Just grab, a, grab an instrument. Show the enemy that you're the anointed one to bring forth sound. We should be ready in season and out of season, running to the call as worshipers. Worshipers are ready in season and out of season. And I want to see any of you get up to Desmond. Come on, you were up there. I saw you. Come on, brother. All the Zidics, if you're here, look at This is what the, the worship team is supposed to look like, men and women, together, same time, same place. Is that okay? It's beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm complimenting. Is that good? Some of you look mad at me. Don't be mad. Come on. This is how it's supposed to be. Abba wants us to be unified on, multi, on multiple levels. So Abba, we thank you for your word. Even though we couldn't finish everything today, Abba, we know that you are moving in our midst. You are moving in the hearts of your people. There is so much transpiring, Abba. So much transpiring. And Abba, we want to be in the right place at the right time. Abba, forgive us for any sins, setbacks, or doubts that we might have had. Forgive us, Abba. Abba, if there's anyone struggling with any form of sin, I pray that their hearts will be moved on and that they would run up here right away so that we can pray for them. If you are struggling with anything, if, if it's not sin, just if there's a challenge so that no one thinks that you're up here because you're sinning, just whatever the challenge is, or run up here. And allow Abba to minister to you. And worship team, if you could just strum something, whatever comes in your spirit, anything. Remember King David? He's, he brought shalom to the king just by strumming an instrument. And if you're coming up for prayer, I need men and women to run up here that are prayer warriors. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Because there's, there's a rough time coming and we want to be in the right place at the right time. In the right, and with the right people so that we can be unified, everyone knowing who each other are. You that are watching, we pray that Abba comforts you right where you're at. Get the notes, you guys. Go through the rest of the study. It's, it's, there's a lot more in there that'll bless you. We praise you, Abba. I pray even now that those that are up here, that whatever is going on, no matter what level it's in, may the shackles begin to fall. May the chains begin to disintegrate there's someone watching that just wants to have that relationship with Abba Abba we pray that they would surrender their lives right where they stand surrender their heart their mind their strengths weaknesses abilities accomplishments or failures would seem to be failures Abba we thank you for your chesed your rachamim Abba we pray that the the power gifts will manifest in your people the gift of prophecy the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the eyes to see past the facade and, and reach out in the spirit realm to the soul of man that is crying and screaming to come out of that place. 
Abba, may your Ruach move upon your people in the audience or watching. Let them sing a new song. Let their spirit be released and let them speak a new song. Abba, we pray that you would close the mouth to the backbiters, gossipers, slanderers, those who commit Lashon Hara. Abba, may their hearts be circumcised so they don't do that anymore, so that they stay close to the brethren without all of that. We don't want to be the same. We don't want to be the same. We don't want to come here to have our toes tickled or our, our armpits tickled or someone whispering in our ears what we want to hear. Abba, we want to walk in your truth and power and victory every day. We thank you for the name of Yah, for it is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. We thank you for the Shvu, the returning to Him. Who's the Him? The Him that came to redeem His people back unto Himself. The gardener. The gardener of the garden. The one who knows how to cause a dead, what seems like a dead plant to sprout again. The one who knows how to water the roots of those who are weary or heavy laden. The one who knows how to prune the tree of those struggling in sin so that they do not produce the fleshly works. Abba, we just praise you. We pray for all the assemblies in this region that we would be unified without compromising the, the, the truth of Abba's word, whether you're a Christian, a Messianic Hebrew roots, a follower, a disciple of the Most High. Let's line up with the word. Let's be unified in these days of challenge and trial and tribulation. Abba, I pray that you would break off of the people here watching wherever you are that standoffish type of spirit, Abba. Those, those walls that people put up, that, Abba, we pray that they would be broken down. No more barriers between brethren. Break the walls down. You called us to something greater than religion. You've called us to walk in the anointing and in the power of your Ruach. Abba, we pray that gifts of healing would flood this place. Heal your people. Heal your people, Abba, in their bodies that have been crying out to you. Heal them. Restore the pancreas. Restore the kidneys. Restore the liver. Restore the stomach lining, the intestinal tracts, both of them. Abba, heal your people from cancer and sickness and disease. Those who went wayward and sowed uh, lascivious lifestyles in their bodies. Abba, you said, whatsoever a man sows in his flesh, that shall he also reap. Abba, we cry out for your chesed, your mercy, to be poured out. Remember the sacrifice of our Mashiach who laid his life down for his people, who rose in the power of your spirit from the grave, from the dead, and made his seal stamp of approval when he stepped out of that tomb. You purchased us back with your blood. You rose us up from the dead of sin. You changed our course. You turned the helm of the wheel and directed us back towards the promised land. You directed us back towards Eden. We praise you, Abba. We praise you, Abba. Hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Most High. We praise you, Most High. We exalt your mighty name. We thank you for repentance. We thank you for the cloven tongues of fire. We thank you for the anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh. We thank you, thank you, thank you, Abba. We praise you, we worship you, we bow before you. We surrender all to you, really, this time. Really this time, Abba. Oh, we surrender everything. We want to be real because you can see past it all. You see right through us. Abba, may there be a fresh anointing on the, on the worship team, those that are there, those that are hungry for you, Abba. We thank you. Hallelujah. Those in the balcony, minister to your people. Let them know this is not, wherever your people are, that this is not entertainment. That you're trying to get our attention. You're trying to remove the old garments, the old jackets, so that we can put on 
the garments of praise and righteousness that are only found in Mashiach. And we thank you, Abba, for today. And we'll seal this as you're still ministering to your people. You don't have to leave. Just let them minister to you. I say amen and amen to this prayer. And we thank you, Abba. Amen and amen.